Hello, and thank you for joining us in the Samson Historical Study on this wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Um, I know we are very much looking forward to Halloween and all of the big things coming up this week. Uh, you can find us here every Wednesday at 4 p.m. And I have Jacob here with me this week. Hello again. <laughs> so if you didn't watch our last video over the William Beadle case, um, that was a that was a pretty tough true crime case that we went over. It was pretty intense, yeah. Uh, we really wanted to baptize Jacob by fire on his first <laughs> his first joint on a, in the study here, but uh, this one is going to be it's going to be a lot softer. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So to go with today, we actually I want to talk about uh, kind of a this day in history that would have happened yesterday. So uh, unfortunately, it didn't fall quite perfectly, but I think it's important to talk about nonetheless. So. I'm uh, pretty sure you've heard of the Boston Tea Party, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Feel good about that one? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so it happened on December 16th, 1773 in Boston Harbor. And you've probably seen a lot of images that look just like this one here. Uh, we've got people dressed up, throwing boxes of, of cargoes of tea into the harbor. And, you know, this very, very large protest, right? Sounds like a grand old time. Did you know that was not the only tea party? Like tea party is in like the dumping, only, dumping ocean of the tea or just like having the only, tea? The only tea party protest. Okay. Okay. No, I didn't. I, I thought that was the only one. It is not. Oh, so we're okay. going to talk about one that was very different today from kind of any other protest. It was one of a kind and it's, it's pretty cool. And so it actually happened almost a year later on October 25th, 1774. Hmm. So... And it happened down in Edenton. So this was actually not considered a major event. It didn't really show up in the local newspapers, um, but it was picked up by the Virginia Gazette. So that's how we know a little bit more about it. Okay. But it was the first political event that was organized solely by women. And so that's why it's so unique. And I, I'm really excited to get to talk about it today. Yeah. So kind of quick history. Why did these tea parties happen? What... What was going on that people were so upset that they dressed up and threw tea in the harbor or uh, the, the, this group of women staged their particular protest. So a lot of people I know about, you know, no taxation without representation. We hear that in school. We, we know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, but it was kind of a long drawn out thing. It, did, it wasn't one instigating incident that caused all this. So. You have the Crown and Parliament that are attempting to recover debts uh, that were accrued during the French and Indian War. So they felt like the colonies were partially responsible for this prolonged war with France they had. And they're saying, well, you need to pay your share of the taxes to, to do that. And in a lot of cases, more than your share hmm. is what's actually happening here. Hmm. And so, yeah, so they pressured the colonies to kind of foot that bill and... and um, with that, they raised levies and taxes on common items, and they were all consumable items. Mm. Okay, so you have paper and playing cards and things like that that are all being being taxed, including mm -hmm. tea. And so, this first the first act was actually the Townsend Revenue Act, one that we don't hear a lot about, um, but it was kind of that start of no taxation by representation. And at this time, they they did start taxing tea. And that's important because how much tea, I want you to guess a number. How many, how much tea do you think the colonists drank Ooh. during that time? You know, I'm going to be honest. I have no idea. I'm going to guess at least, I'm going to guess at least three cups a day. Okay. I mean like collectively. Uh, collectively. Okay. <laughs> so what? I mean, 13 colonies, that's, uh, are you thinking weight? Yes. Okay. Maybe like, I don't know, five, six Tons? Uh, probably more. I don't know. I, I 1.2 million pounds. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to convert tons. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I went to school to be a writer, so I'm not going to do that math in my head. Well, let's uh, someone you, in the comments. Someone in your comments is going to yeah. tell us. Uh -huh. Genuinely appreciate your help. <laughs> um, so 1.2 million pounds a year. So that's a lot of tea that's yeah. all being imported. That's a lot of tax money. Yeah. So that's a major revenue. And so they're, I guess they're also taxing paper and paint and lead and all of these things that they're using. But there's a bunch of protests. They're like, hey, 
yeah, we don't we don't like that and start boycotting different things. So because of that, they actually repeal all of these taxes except for the tax on tea that stays. Mm. And so with that, um, you have a little bit later, the 1773 Tea Act comes along, which is the one that most of us are fairly familiar with. And it granted the British East Indian Company a monopoly on tea sales. Well, that's good for competition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are uh, not, not super great for the market, right? Yeah, no. Because with these taxes, we have um, smuggling that starts. Ah. And so the smugglers are doing okay. Like, they like the fact that these taxes are levied on teas because it brings... They can have a lower price. They're not paying the taxes. They're getting more money. And exactly. So as soon as this tea act is passed, then you have the smugglers who are mad too. And they're not just like average people. You might remember some of these names from your history books. Uh, John Hancock. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, actually. Yeah, Sam Adams. Yep. Yeah, both him. of them big tea smugglers. Really? Yeah, so they're now opposing this tea act because they're like, well, well, wait a minute. Because now the East India Company says, that's okay. You smuggle tea. We're going to drop our prices. Ooh. And we're going to sell directly to the consumer. Ooh. So now they're competition. So they're like, wait, 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 wait. If you're not going to charge outrageous prices, then why are you even doing this? Yeah. So they start opposing this act because it's their competition. It's taking money right out of their pockets. Yeah. This imported tea is cheaper than the smuggled tea. Wow. Who'd have thought? That's, yeah. wow. <laughs> I didn't know that they'd smuggled tea. That's... That's pretty cool, honestly. I think it's cool. funny that they weren't super mad about it until it affected their bottom line. Though they're like, "Well, that's a, that's a bummer, yeah. guys. Another tax on tea. Here's who, here's this for you. Who, who allowed this? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> but um, then you have this this provincial and colonial government that's being built, and you have these provincial deputies, and those th these were actually. Um, selected and they were chosen at the first provincial congress in august of 1774 so it's the start of this kind of re rebel government okay so they were deputies they were deputies not for the crown no for the congress oh, okay and so they were and my deputies are really representatives of the colony they come from that's what their interest is okay. their, their interest is not necessarily the bigger congress their interest is their colony okay gotcha so um they meet and they do that all, like, despite specific orders not to, right? Because typically rebel governments listen to the motherland on that. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and they meet. And one of these representatives uh, is for um, North Carolina. And so we have this little town of Edenton. That's going to, we'll have a map up here. And it's actually a map from 1769. So there's Edenton right there. It's a booming town. It is. Um, it's a cute little port town. Um, it's located west of the Albemarle Sound. And if you're from this area, please tell me how to pronounce that correctly because I did my best. There's a lot of weird L's in that word. <laughs> um, but it's a great little port town. Um, it's coastal. It's very good farming, especially in this era. And it's it's fairly wealthy. It's a little kind of a little metropolis. And... In this little town, you have a woman by the name of Penelope Barker. Penelope Barker. Penelope Barker. Uh, and it is a name that far more people should know. Mm. And she was born in 1728. She is a native to Edenton. And her father was Samuel Paget, who is a very well-known farmer and planter. Or, I'm sorry, planter and physician, rather. And her mother, Mary Elizabeth Blount, who um, was the daughter of James Blount. And the really cool thing is... Bell becomes from a line of activists. So James Blount was actually an active participant in the Culpeper Rebellion in 1677. Ooh. So this is this is in her blood. Yeah. Right. And so I think that's I think that's pretty cool. Just the line of revolutionaries. And that was actually an uprising against British navigation acts. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> you have this whole line of of people that doesn't really like the British government. <laughs> and they're not a fan, to say the least. She's exactly. The right person for the job. Yes. And uh, so at age 17, it's now 1745, uh, she marries her sister's widower. So her sister passes away unexpectedly. She marries her husband, John Hodgson, which is really not an uncommon thing in the time, um, especially because her sister had three children. Um, Isabella, John, and Robert, and so she takes on the role of, of mothering her sister's three children. And 
Uh, her and John had two children together. We have Samuel and Thomas, two boys. Um, and that's only in about, they're only married for about two years till John passes away in, in 1747. And so now she has five children that she's taking care of. Wow. And the thing is, John was pretty well off as well. I mean, they're a good family. So she's now running this estate. She has all of the things that she brought to the marriage and what John brought to the marriage and what her sister brought to the marriage. So she's managing a lot. Yeah. A lot of funds. Um, after a while, she marries John Craven. Or I'm sorry, James Craven. And he's a wealthy planter. So she's a pretty hot commodity on the market right now. Yeah. Uh, with everything she has. He and she are married for four years. And he also dies. Mm. So That's I remember, tough. I'm sorry, I told you nobody would die in this one. I didn't necessarily mean that. Wow. I know, I led you astray. <laughs> <laughs> but Penelope is now 27, and uh, she actually doesn't marry for a few more years. But again, she's starting to get all these suitors because she is incredibly wealthy at this time. And she marries Thomas Barker. And so, last name, this one sticks. They're That's good for a while. Good. Um, so he's also an Edenton, Edenton, Edenton native and a widower. Um, they're a little bit older now. He is 16 years her senior, which, again, at this time, and, and even at that age gap is really not that big when you look at how much life has been lived. Yeah. Um, he is a lawyer and a member of the North Carolina Assembly. So he's involved in the government, the law, and, again, he's well off in, in a prominent member not only in their area but in north carolina in general and so he actually after four years of them being married gets sent off to england oh. and so he goes back as a representative um and he represents north carolina in england now he is stuck in england until 1778. wow so, so he's there for a oh, while man. and uh, before he left they did have uh, three children of their own. Unfortunately, none of their children did survive infancy. Wow. So, um, between her marriages, Penelope actually gives birth to five children and cared for four children belonging to her husband. Um, and in 1772, only one of those is still surviving. Wow. Yeah. So, she's really somebody who faced a lot of hardship really early on. Mm -hmm. um, and had to take on a lot of responsibility and financial responsibility, yeah. which was kind of unique at her age. Um, but that was, you know, that was what happened when people were widowed. They then became in control of their husband's businesses and estates. So uncommon, not unheard of mm -hmm. in general. But to the scale that she was doing it, it was pretty big. Yeah. Um, so with that, and combine that with the knowledge that she has from her husband's political career, all the things that he's discussing with her, she's pretty well versed and she, she knows what's going on. So how does this all relate to the Edmonton Tea Party, right? Because that's what this is about. Mm -hmm. And there is a proclamation that is drafted. Uh, and there's a lot of, a little bit of speculation around certain things. Penelope Barker is the one believed pretty commonly to have been the one who wrote that first draft. And in, the first 14 is where we get a little bit of speculation. So this is signed by 51 women. So wow. it, yeah, it ends up being like, it's kind of a big deal, right? Yeah. And uh, most were from Edenton, Edenton families, but several came from around the county and other neighboring towns and cities. So the people that she's connected with and that her, these other people, these other women, um, were connected with to create this this proclamation and put their weight behind it and they come from a variety of social classes which is also very unique now the first 14 were all wealthy they're all prominent families probably people that she had in her personal social circle um, that she got to sign this and um from there there's a little bit of debate where that first signing took place so you have the camp that believes that the first 14 all met at Penelope's house helped her write the first draft, and um, it all started there. Uh, there's also another camp that believes that everything happened at the house of uh, Mrs. Elizabeth King, who was another woman in Edenton. And so 
either way, there it, it, there is agreement that the, the the largest portion of the signing did happen at the king home. So Penelope took it took it there. Gotcha. Um, they used a lot of their connections through their church, and that would be uh, St. Paul Episcopal Church in Edmonton, which is actually still standing. You can still visit it. Oh, cool. Yeah, so that would be really cool. I would love to do that one day. And they use that to gain other signers in the community. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's pretty cool. And so uh, I've got a, just a few of the women here that, I, that are listed with them um, that kind of show the variety of social class. So you have... Lydia Boyd Bennett, who was the wife of a hat maker. Um, you also have uh, Elizabeth Green and Anne Hornablow, who both of their husbands owned and operated taverns. Penelope Dawson was the daughter of a colonial governor. Nice. And Margaret Pearson, who was the mother of an English baronet. Uh, a a baronet. baronet? Yeah. I don't... We There's a whole other video to talk about how that all breaks down. Okay. But English... <laughs> Important English person. Okay, got it. So somebody was, with, a, with a title. Okay, good. <laughs> I was definitely thinking like instrument player or something. I. <laughs> He's a very well known instrument player. Uh, no. <laughs> I was off the uh, Got it. Got it. Um, but that kind of shows that you have these working class women also. You have Penelope, who, well, yes, she's running her household, has never held a trade job. And then you have these women who are working side by side with their husband at jobs that are, are trade you know, vocations. And so um, they did not include the the poorer women in that. Um, and the kind of the speculative reasoning is that it would have taken away the weight of the people signing it to have people without note, note and name um, included. Mm -hmm. And so they actually write this and they send it to England. I guess. Do you remember who's in England? Oh, yes. I, I don't remember his name. Um, her husband. Yes. Her yeah. husband is in England. So he flees to France. Because uh, oh. when your wife sends a really nasty letter to the king of England, you don't usually stick around. Right? Oh, what's going what's gonna to happen here? I can't wait to see how that unfolds. Yeah. So, I, oh my goodness. That's... <laughs> so he flees to France for a bit. Takes his time over there. Um, eventually does return to England and then to the colonies, but he lets that he lets that cool yeah. for a while, which was probably smart, right? Yeah, good move on his part. Right. Um, so the original document that they sent over is, as far as I could tell, is, is kind of long been lost. We don't mm. have that original letter anymore, right? So, which is super unfortunate. Yeah. But when a group of angry women sends you a letter, it's not necessarily like it, from from a small colony. Not necessarily something you keep, right? Yeah. Um, especially in this day and age, and if you're the king of England, who uh, we're not super cool with, right, at the time. Yeah. But um, November 3rd, 1774, the Virginia, Virginia Gazette actually published um, the following paragraph, and I'll read it to you, uh, followed by the names of all the signers. And it's really hard to see. You can, we'll leave this up for a minute. Uh, but in the upper left-hand corner, that's where this is appearing, where you have those two columns. Those are the names. But above it, it says, um, As we cannot be indifferent on any occasion that appears nearly to affect the peace and happiness of our country, and that as it has been long thought necessary for the public good to enter into several particular resolves by a meeting of members deputed from the whole province, it is a duty which we owe not only to our near and dear connections who have concurred in them, but to ourselves, who are essentially interested in their welfare, to do everything as far as lies in our power to testify our sincere adherence to the same. And we do, therefore, accordingly subscribe this paper as witness to our fixed intention and solid determination to do so. So, they are all binding together in this boycott. That's what it is. It is a boycott of these goods that are being brought in. And who holds the purchasing power in the household today? Women. Women. Yeah. And so who holds the purchasing power in the household? Then still, women. women, because they're the ones running the household. So it's kind of interesting because you have, you know, these little kind of lo localities that are saying, like, yes, good for them, like, appreciating that strength and, and that gesture. But in England, they're saying, that's not very important. But then they're taking the time to openly mock these women. 
really? in what they're doing. Yeah. So they were in England not being taken seriously. Um, kind of. Like that's that's what it, they're trying to portray, right? So you have James Aradell Sr., who was a lawyer and an essayist and eventually a Supreme Court justice. He was born in England, came over here actually as comptroller um, for the king, uh, defected and then started working you know, immediately against England when he got here and realized that he aligned with the colonial kind of thought there. And so um, his brother Arthur remained in England. Hmm. And Arthur wrote in a letter to his brother, um, the only security on our side is the probability that there are but a few places in America which possess so much female artillery as Eddington. So he's saying... He's mocking them. He's saying sarcastically, well, luckily we'll be okay because uh, they don't have angry women like that everywhere. Whoa. Great. Yeah. It's it's very much a tongue-in-cheek, like, well, we would, good thing we have this on our side. Oh, because that's like, because it, it, it's like, yeah, they're not, like, they don't want to take it seriously, but, like, they acknowledge that, like, there's some influence there yeah yeah so they're saying huh. they're saying well it's enough it's enough to be mentioned right like it's enough that's irritating yeah. enough to write a letter to say well guess we'll be okay because not every word's like that like yeah and kind of snotty about it um and then you have this caricature that appeared in the morning chronicle and the london advertiser and was published um in january 16th of 1775 and so we're going to talk about this for a second so here's the caricature, and if you look closely, um, all the women are unflattering depictions. Uh, the woman that is written as the leader is written, is shown as very, very masculine, um, all with questionable, questionable morality. You have them sidling up to men. You have a baby on the floor being ignored. And so the whole point is to portray these women as immoral, not worthy of your opinion, and as just... Something that can be pushed aside because mm. they're clearly of poor moral fiber. And that this is an English rendering. This is an English print. So for something that they're saying isn't to be taken seriously, they're putting some effort into it. Yeah, it's like, it's almost like we're not, we're not taking you seriously, but we're, like, we're trying to like undercut you. We want, but we're not taking it seriously. Yeah, we want you to know that we're not taking you seriously. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> that's it seems like we kind of take it a little, little seriously but right. i don't know maybe uh, maybe that's just me i guess i don't know i don't know <laughs> it's like somebody saying it doesn't bother you maybe maybe a little bit kind of seems like it does i think it kind of does it just something about it and so um with this there's a little bit of folklore which i always think is cool right like local yeah. legend uh and it's one of the things said that i read said that um the women did not you know obviously sip tea at their meeting uh, but they made themselves a tea of mulberry leaves, lavender, and other herbs. And that's what they were drinking instead of imported tea from, from England that they would be taxed and duty on. Yeah. So I think that's cool. Um, I've never had a mulberry tea, but... Sounds better than that British tea. That's right. That's my only choice. <laughs> Solidarity. We're, we're doing it. <laughs> um, but this is actually largely pushed as a footnote in history for many, many years. It's not something people talk about, which, like, when you're comparing it with, you know, the Boston Tea Party, you have all of these men, like, throwing, like, boarding ships and throwing things into the water. Like, that's dramatic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and, and this is essentially, it, it does seem smaller scale, but it actually had a much bigger impact because it's showing and being written about in these newspapers and it's showing other women of the period that there is solidarity in these boycotts, then that does matter. So the financial impact has potential for, for more longevity mm -hmm. than an isolated incident. Yeah. So the first real effort to actually document the occurrence comes in 1890. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that's uh, with Richard Dillard. And he was a local North Carolina historian. Uh, he coined the name Eddington Tea Party. So he's the one who really dubbed it the Eddington Tea Party. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously he's, he's pulling from the Boston Tea Party, things like that. But mm -hmm. he's the first one to actually write it down. And um, 
Then, on October 24th in 1908, the local DAR dedicated a monument to the ladies of Edenton. And we actually have a photo of it. Um, it's not a, not a great photo, uh, but you can see here you have this very large teapot and on the side it does have an inscription and then on the other side is an image of the woman and I urge you to, to search it. This is an old postcard from Edenton. That's what oh. this is. But it's mounted on top of a cannon. Oh, That's yeah, a cannon barrel. Nice. So it's really cool. Um, and so actually many of the places that were involved in this story still stand. Structures still stand. Uh -oh. So that includes the Chowan County Courthouse, which is right there. Um, and it was erected in 1767. And then St. Paul's Episcopal Church, where several signers are actually buried in that churchyard. It can be visited. Um, and we do have a, a full list of all the signers that we can post to you as you're interested. We'll put it in the comments um, so we can, we can get that to you. Uh, and Penelope's home that she and her husband built after he returned. So it was actually after the whole um, Edenton Tea Party happened. Mm -hmm. um, but her home still stands and was actually moved to a different location but is still in Edmonton and you can be it can be visited so that's pretty cool yeah um now her and her husband are actually not buried there in Edmonton they are buried at the Hayes Plantation nearby after she passed away in 1796 mm. so she lived a very long life yeah and uh, did some really cool things with it right mm -hmm. so um yeah, I, I thought this was a cool thing to share. I really wish we had been able to share it yesterday on the day that it happened. Uh, but hopefully this gives everyone a chance to learn a little bit of that kind of lesser known history. But like it's still still really important. Yeah. And it's kind of what we do here is we share history that may be forgotten. So um, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. And please put those in the comments. Uh, let us know if you're from the area and have been to these places. Let us know what they're like. And we always love hearing from you. We're actually going to be in um, Camden, South Carolina in the second weekend of November. So if you're on that side of the country, come see us. It's a really cool event. We love going. Um, and we'll have, have our shop there and hopefully to see you all. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So we will see you all next week. Wednesday at 4 p.m. Bye.